Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be talking about the Circa Millions contest, which uh, runs concomitantly with the uh, the Survivor Pool contest from the Circa Sports facility. And we're going to talk about how we're going to approach this this season, same as last season. And as much as people don't know how to play the Survivor Pool uh, business, I think that people are far worse at approaching the Circa Millions contest. Um, now, if that's the case, why am I not entering 10, 20 times into this? Um, because I really am not sure the best way to do this. Um, I do know the best way to do this, but I don't know how to execute this the right way. But conceptually, I promise you that, let's just say that in survivor pools, maybe, I don't know, only 80% of the people play atrociously. I'm 100% sure, 100% sure, that 90% plus of the entries in the Circa Millions contest are playing atrociously, okay? The only problem is, while I know how to play better than atrociously, I don't know if I'm playing all that well, um, but we, we're, we're figuring it out and we're gonna figure it out along the way. And I do promise you that in, oh, I don't know, two years, three years, there will be models and Sims that will basically be uh, perfecting the approach that I talk about here in a similar way that five years ago, nobody knew how to play anything about survivor. Now people know at least enough to be only slightly losers. Um, right now, the circa millions contest is being completely misplayed by 90% of the field. Um, and it's actually quite charming the way this happens. Okay. So what this is, is very simple, right? You got to pick five games against the spread, all right? You get one point if you win. You get zero points if you lose. And you get 0.5 points if you push. Very, very easy, right? And whichever, whoever, whatever entry has the most points at the end of the season wins all the cheese. Now, it's not exactly that easy. You have this first, second, third, fourth. There's also points to be made in in certain quarters, like if, if you, if you're the winner in you know, weeks one through five or something like that, you make money as well. But, but that, that's, 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 that's secondary. The point is, is that you have to beat all the other people or as many of the people as possible in a contest that pays one point for a win against the spread 0.5 for a push and zero for a loss. The spreads come out on Thursdays. And you have to lock in your, if you want to play a Thursday or Friday night game, you have to lock your pick in Thursday. Otherwise you have until I think Saturday or late Saturday to lock in your picks for Sunday. And what's charming about this is it, it, it sets itself up as this contest that people say, okay, I'm really good at picking against the spread. I'm going to put my skills up against everybody else and see if I'm better than, see if my picks are better than everybody else's. And that's the way 90% of the people play this pool. And I guess for the 10% that are playing it correctly or 5% are playing it correctly, you're, you're looking at me like, well, of course. Okay. But I was shocked when I looked at the pick distributions to see how, I mean, ignorant is kind of a harsh word, but in, in the true sense, how ignorant people are to this. And I guess it's probably because I play DFS that I'm more in tune with this than, than people that are just, you know, sports betters that are trying to pick against the spread. Um, Because like in DFS, when you play daily fantasy sports, it's not about picking the best play. It's, it's about picking the best play that the fewest people are going to play. Right? Because you're, you're not... You're not competing like in DFS against the bookie. You know what I mean? You're competing against everybody else. You don't need to be great. You need to be better than everybody else. And so in daily fantasy sports, if you have two different plays, you know, one of which is going to be projected 
you know, very close to the other one as far as their ability to score points, for example. And that play is being played by, say, 10 times the amount of people as the other player. Then you're supposed to play the guy that's playing, you know, one tenth of the ownership. And that for daily fantasy sports is just so trivial that it's not even worth mentioning. But in this particular contest, nobody seems to get it. I, I don't I don't quite understand why people just sit and grind and they pick their top five picks against the spread and they put them in and are basically giving money away, okay, by doing that. The reason for that is, is for those of you that haven't picked up on this yet, listen, NFL lines are very, very tight. They're very, very sharp. And in the long run, most people are going to get about, make about 50%, okay? If you're just really super sharp, maybe you'll get 53. If you are just an outlier, maybe you'll get 55%, whatever. These lines are really, really sharp, okay? Forget about trying to pick the teams you like and worry about who everybody else is going to pick, okay? Try to find teams that are going to be low-owned. Try to find teams that no, that people are not going to be picking. Try to find teams that people are going to be picking and go against them. I saw over the last couple of years, I mean, week after week, examples of teams that were that had like 10 to 1 leverage in some cases over other teams. 5 to 1 leverage, 4 to 1 leverage. So, sometimes you had teams that were literally 10% owned, okay? And other other teams that were like say 40% owned or something like that. The edge that you have by figuring out or attempting to figure out who other people have and fade them or better yet even leverage straight against them is the entire sum is the entire strategy and the entire key to this contest okay like for example let's 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 you know the uh there was something in poker the the Sklansky theory of poker sort of and this is kind of like a derivative of that I'm kind of butchering it a little bit Sklansky theory of poker is is you have to pretend that everybody's cards are turned over right and and you have to gauge how you did if everybody knew what everybody else had, okay? So in a, in, a, in a competition like this, if you could flip over with, you know, just as the, uh, just as the, uh, the, the contest is about to start and know who everybody had in this contest, you would probably have, I don't know, what, 900% ROI or something like that. If you knew that a team was 10 times as own as another team and you could just take pick the take the other one you would have just in, an insane edge okay far more than if you were the greatest sports bettor in the world picking against my daughter who is picking teams based on their on, on how nice their uniforms are okay or worse so um the key to this pool is figuring out the popular teams and not playing them, figuring out the unpopular teams and playing them. And God forbid you have an unpopular team against a popular team, then then it's it's gold. Okay, so yes, is that easy? No. But at least you know what you're trying to accomplish as opposed to, well, let me just pick who my five favorite teams are. That That's what you have to do when you play against the bookie. You know, you play your favorite, you know, teams against the spread and you lay the 110 or whatever against the bookie, but you're not playing against the bookie. You're playing against this in this enormous pool of people. Okay. Um, so how do we infer what teams are, how teams are going to be owned? Now there, there are some sites that track this, um, not for Circa, because that would be unethical, right? To, to to release who everybody has beforehand, okay? Um, but there are sites that track who who people are playing against the spread. You know, the office football pool, they have certain certain uh certain places you could go that'll that'll track uh pool-wide picks against the spread. You could go to, 
you know, covers.com. That's another site that you could look up, you know, consensus plays. As a matter of fact, I haven't even looked at these places yet um, for the season, but just to kind of see um, what they would look like. Let's see, go to covers.com. Uh, I think these are all free. Uh, let's see, consensus, is that still a thing? Uh, odds, where was consensus? NFL, there used to be a consensus. Maybe they don't have that anymore. I'm, I'm sure there are, okay? It used to be. Contests? No, Streak Survivor. Maybe they got rid of that. There used to be a consensus. Oh, consensus picks, there it is. So consensus picks, let's go back there. You go to picks, consensus picks, NFL. And it will give, like, who, based on their, you know, polling, who everybody is taking, you know? And this is a 1,200-pick sample. Um and you could get into the weeds of where this is kind of coming from and stuff like that. But nonetheless, it will show you who the most popular picks are against the spread. Okay. And is that going to be a hundred percent accurate for circuit? No, but it gives you at least an idea of, of, of where you should be going. Okay. Um, like for now, like let's take a look. So, so Cincinnati 69%. Now we're not even talking about to win the game. This is against the spread. 69% of the of, of the people are taking Cincinnati. 66% of the people are taking the, the, the Saints. 65 are taking Houston, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So one way you could play if you wanted to and completely outperform, okay, really the people that are just, just grinding and, and picking their favorites is you could go for one to covers.com as a starter. Okay. And listen, the, the farther along in the week this goes, like the more picks are registered, the more likely it is going to be consensus, you know, um, and just take the top five lowest consensus teams there are. And you will, I believe if you did this and someone could send this out for me from last year, if they had access to the old covers thing, you would outperform the average Circa player. Okay. Um, it's just the way the math works. Um, now, again, this isn't always 100%, but at least it's a place to start. You know, you don't want to play the, a team that you know is 70% or 66% against the uh, against the spread. Now, another thing that you could do if you wanted to, if you didn't want to just rely on this data, is you could kind of uh, theorize as to what types of teams are likely to be picked. And we did this week after week last year, and I'm going to tell you the results of, of, of our work. Okay. Here were our theories. There are, there are two things, two separate things going on. Um, first is what types of teams would you think people wanted to play? Remember you have your choice of five. Okay. You don't have to pick every team. You what what I would imagine is people like to do what they like to play favorites. They like to play home teams, right? So home favorites. Uh, they like to play kind of good teams, whatever that means, right? They don't want to like if, if there's like a crappy team that's a favorite, yeah, they might not play them. So you want good teams at home as a favorite. That, that that's what people you know like to do, especially when they don't have to pick pick everything. They have their five favorite ones. The next thing is that people, this is the theory, they like to do is they like to, if they're playing a favorite, they don't want to, they, they want to be on the right side of those key numbers. Like, like you, you really want to lay two and a half instead of three or three and a half. You really want to lay six and a half instead of seven or seven and a half. Okay. Now, if you did want an underdog, for example, you'll be more inclined to want to play, take the seven and a half or the three and a half. That's psychological, right? Um, so if you put together like what types of teams people should want to play, that would be home team favorites, usually laying six and a half, you know, or, or two and a half or something like that. And the teams that people will be unlikely to play are the underdogs, on the road, usually getting either two and a half or six and a half. Um, 
And now that seems like a very, very logical theory to kind of go into this. Okay. Um, let's, you want to adjust that first? No, let's, let's take the other two things for uh, next. And then we'll get back to this. The other thing is this Thursday game. So the, the other thing that you'll see every week is that the Thursday game is always the lowest owned game. And there's a really good reason for that. Okay. Because the lines come out and then they're, they're static, right? They don't move. And if you lock in a team on Thursday, Okay, then you don't get the benefit of possible line movement on other games. Okay, so like let's say the other teams had big injury news over the next couple of days, you would you would have wasted a pick that you could have used getting really good line value um, later. So one of my theories is is yes, that's true, but maybe it's worth taking the um the low owned team anyway just because again if that's the main goal maybe we'll eat that possibility of missing out on a little bit of line value and we'll get back to that in a second as well so i'm kind of into playing the thursday games if they fit other 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 qualities now i mentioned line value let's say that the line comes out and I don't know the I can't even think of a team to use an exam as an example. Okay. Let's say that the Bengals. Okay. Let's, let's, let's say the, the line comes out and the dolphins are minus three and a half over the Jaguars. And then let's say Travis Etienne and, and Trevor Lawrence and the entire offensive line get the flu. They're all ruled out. And the actual line moves to 10. Okay. Or let's let's more realistic. Let's say that just Lawrence is out or something. And it moves to say six uh dolphins minus six and a half or something like that. Well, the actual line is still three and a half for the purposes of the contest. So you're getting three points of immediate line value if you play the dolphins. So the herein lies a very interesting question. Like, what do you do? Well, if you do play the dolphins you're going to be playing an 80% owned team, right? Because everybody's going to play them. However, they do have a very, very good chance to, to cover. I mean, you get three points of line value is huge, okay? So is it worth giving up the, the for example, is it worth playing the high-owned team for the purposes of, of just getting that three points of line value? Or is it better to be contrarian and take the 20% owned team, knowing you're giving up three points of line value. Now, I have not simmed this out, but I will just share with you what I what I learned from probably the best sports better I know, and his name is going to be uh, withheld. But he told me, and I told him, that, you know, he never did this contest before, but I told him the rules, and I told him this particular situation, and he told me without hesitating that... You have to eat the chalk and play the line value. And, and his logic was that there's just too small of a sample size, this 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 tournament, at five games per week to be able to overcome that incredible line value that you're going to be getting. I mean, it makes sense. Um, I still am not convinced mathematically, but the fact that he answered so quickly... Uh, I, I'm sort of inclined to believe it, but that's that is something that you have to you have to think about. Okay. Um, so if you are not going to play a Thursday game, for example, for the purposes of of you know waiting of saving line value, if you're not too worried about the line value piece anyway, may as well take a shot at the low on Thursday game, right? So again, th these are things you think about in this contest, having nothing to do with who you actually like. Um, okay, another thing that I wanted to, to to talk about before getting back to the results of my theories was that these lines that are right on the number, like three or seven or even four or whatever, what they bring into play is a push. And while I know that pushes count like a half, which is not the end of the world, I feel as though when you're trying to beat 
thousands and thousands of people, you want to only play like teams with max upside. So if you have a, if you play a team, I, I feel as though if you get a push, it's almost like getting a loss, you know, because you, you, you're really, you're not gaining on anybody that played that game. Um, so I, what I was doing last year is, is just avoiding all teams with push, with, with push vague. Okay. Um, so what are the results and how are we going to approach this year? Well, the one thing that I guess I overestimated was the impact of this six and a half point spread business. Okay. I really thought that these road six and a half point underdogs would be very low owned. And I thought that the home six and a half point favorites would be very high owned. It just turned out to not be the case. Either my theory was flawed or it was like an outlier for the whole season. I'm inclined to believe that just my 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 theory is flawed. Okay. Now I did happen to speak to someone else who's one of the great sports betters in the last couple of days, actually, who told me that over a long period of time, if you just bet six and a half point underdogs and two and a half point underdogs, you you you'd be doing well. Um, so because of that, I might not completely dismiss that six and a half, two and a half point thing. But again, I don't care how well we're doing. I care about what people are picking. Okay. So if there are people picking those things, I don't want them. Um, or I don't want to give extra weight to them. But let me tell you what, if that was I overestimated or whatever, let me tell you what I underestimated. I underestimated how low owned, I'm going to use an analytical term, the shit teams were, okay? If I could, if you could go back and see how low owned, like the Cardinals were every single week when they were viewed as the worst team in the league, when they were getting 13 every week, it's almost as if people were just thinking about whether this was a survivor pool play or not, or whether they were, whether this was, the spread wasn't even involved because the spread's supposed to even all that out right? How bad a team is. But the hashtag bad teams were routinely 10% owned, 12% owned. The Giants, before they become seem somewhat decent, even though they were a New York team, which I would thought would get some love, 13% owned. Okay. So these crappy teams are just brutally under owned. Okay. So when we go into this week, this year, we, and again, the way we measure results is not by results, although that, that helps, <laughs> but we're going to make sure we're going to see how we can do as far as our, you know, simulated ROI, like how we are, how low owned the teams that we end up picking are. Um, and we're going to use a combination of covers.com. We're going to use a cover uh, combination of other maybe sources. But when it comes to just kind of just eyeballing these things, uh, the team that I'm kind of looking at right here is, first of all, you certainly the Patriots, like for sure. I mean, they completely fit the bill. Who's Nobody's playing them. Nobody. I'm going to predict that the Patriots, and we'll see if I'm wrong, okay, that against the spread this week, and again, this is against the spread, and I, I'll, I want to give odds or whatever it is because I'm picking one out of, what, 26 possibles? If the Patriots are not one of the five lowest owned teams, I'd be shocked. Okay. Uh, so there's, I'm definitely playing them. Uh, the Titans I like only because again, it doesn't really fit the bill for, for the, for the, for the, for the point spread thing, but they are on the road against a team that everybody's really into this year. And that'd be the bears. So I think the bears are going to get some, 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 some popularity here. So I'll play the Titans. Um, the Saints are probably a fishy play. Um, I just, I, I, from what I've heard, the Panthers are on everybody's radar, so maybe get some love there. I'll have to think about this one. Cardinals, it's that good spread that may or may not be fraudulent. Uh, on the road against the Bills, I don't know if people really have it in them to take the Cardinals. And the Broncos are supposed to be kind of bad this year, so um, we're going to try them plus six. So all these kind of make sense. Um, but I'm going to finalize these a little bit later. And, and, but this is the way you want to think about these things. Now let's, let's, for example, let's go back to the covers.com. 
Ooh, I see the Saints are six or 66 percent. So I'll probably get rid of those. New England 31. We like that. See, I was thinking about taking the Colts too. And then I was afraid of their popularity, but this is perfect. So if the Colts are projected by at least as one side of being 35, we could take out the Saints and we could put in the, the Colts. And the great part about this is, is that I can say who I'm picking and nobody's going to care. And no, nobody is going to play this one. Okay. They're going to, they're going to, people are going to come to my, my content. And if they get through this, they're going to say, yeah, I know, but you know what I mean? That's what they're going to say. Yeah, I know, but, and, and which is totally chilled, you know, um, cause I know this is the right way to play. I don't know if I'm executing exactly the right way, but this is certainly the way that you should be thinking about this. And I'm telling you in two years, people are going to make models that simulate the popularity of these teams. And this edge will be gone. Okay. But maybe not, you know, picking against the spread is, is like, is like what baseball and apple pie. People don't want to pick low owned teams. People don't want to think about it that way. They want to get as many winners as possible, but that's not, the, it's not the game. It's not to get as many winners as possible. It's to get more wins than your opponents. Okay. Um, let's take a look at some of these others. I mean, while we're here, um, Indianapolis, all right, we got them. We already we got rid of this. We got New England. So these are all okay. Arizona, 36%. Okay, Vegas. Why did I not take Vegas here? Um, well, the problem with Vegas is my infatuation with this, with this push vig, like the plus three. And again, this could be flawed as well, but I just feel as though that playing these push lines just gives up too much upside. So I like the Colts, like the Patriots, like the Cardinals. And the other two are the ones that I'm kind of struggling with right now. But that is, and I'm going to be doing this every single week. We're going to be walking through this. And we are going to attempt to analyze these things in, in, an anal in, 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 a, in a proper way, looking at pick popularity and seeing how we did. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this and uh, good luck.